Here she's coming. Okay, good evening, everyone. Now we're going to start our evening Sunday service. Let's ask you all to please rise as I call our song leader, Preacher Doji DeCastro. Amen. So I'll sing our opening hymns. <laughs> your best to the master all together. Let me hear the ladies this time, ladies. Men this time, men. Others will trust in me.
Amen. You may be seated. Amen. As I call Pastor Francis for announcements. Thank you, Preacher Ben. Good evening. On behalf of our senior pastor, I want to welcome you to our evening service. Uh, we praise God for uh, the, serv the Spanish uh, service this afternoon. We have a, a, whole, uh, a good number of people, I believe more than 30, right? Uh, praise God for that. Uh, quite a few uh, first-time guests, and we thank the Lord for Preacher Gabriel and uh, the family for inviting uh, those um, friends and loved ones of theirs that have come. Uh, please be in prayer uh, for our uh, conference this week. We're going to be busy uh, beginning on Wednesday, so please uh, be in prayer for that, that the Lord will use uh, this conference to speak to the hearts of people. Uh, there will be some delegates uh, that may be arriving on Wednesday, so please pray for their protection and safety. Uh, I believe we are also in the process of looking for some accommodations to all the guests. Uh, pray that uh, God will provide um, places for them. And uh, don't forget our uh, mich uh, International Sunday. Uh, like what we have done uh, la last year, we uh, represented different uh, types of um, nation uh, by way of um, you know their uh, international dress. So uh, kindly wear your costume, amen. And let's be excited. And let's uh, you know let's um, be in prayer for. Um, I believe that uh, day uh, Friday we will be uh, celebrating our pastor's birthday. So it's going to be a busy and a hectic uh, week. So please. Um, Let's, uh, you know, do what we can, amen, uh, for God's glory. Uh, let's, uh, let's all stand as we sing our um, welcoming song. As I call on Preacher Doji. Sing in the service of the King. All together now. I am happy in the service. happy okay we're singing i am happy greet your friend neighbor brother sister with a smile amen Okay, I am happy in the service of the king. I am happy, oh, so happy. To the sunshine and the shadow, I can sing in the service of the king. In the service of the king, every talent I will bring. I am peace and joy and bliss. be seated. Amen. Now we'll move on to our special number, which we brought to us by the Bautista family. Amen. Yes. 
Hey. So will the Bautista family please come forward? <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> Well, it seems like uh, we are all affected. We do have problems, uh, trials, and tribulations, and uh, we have uh, <coughs> sometimes uh, we lose some of our loved ones. Uh, so I remember my dad passed away almost two years uh, from now, two years uh, in a few days. So it seems like... Uh, uh, we, we are questioning God. Does he really cares? That's why uh, we have a lot of, uh, you know, we question about that. And um, he, uh, listen to what the song uh, uh, says to us. Does Jesus care? Does Jesus <laughs> okay. when my heart okay. is pain to <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Does Jesus care when my heart is pain to deeply for me and song? As the burdens press and the cares distress and the way grows weary and long. Oh yes, he cares, I know he cares. In heart he starts with my grief. When the days go weary, the long nights dreary, I know my Savior cares. Does Jesus cares when my way is dark with a nameless dread and fear? As the daylight fades into deep night shades, does he care enough to be near? Oh, yes, he cares. I know he cares. His heart he starts with my grief. When the days grown weary, the long nights dreary, I know my Savior cares. Does Jesus care when I've said goodbye to the dearest on earth to me? And my sad heart aches, still it nearly breaks. Is it all to him does he see? Oh yes, he cares, I know he cares. His heart he starts with my grief. When the days don't weary, the long nights dreary, I know my Savior cares. Praise God for that special number. 
<laughs> Amen. So now we're going to move on to our offertory. As I call two ushers forward, Brother Easy and Brother JD, if we all please stand. May I please have Preacher Jim Latino please pray for our offering. standing we're going to our bible pledge let's hold our bibles over our hearts amen ready begin this is my bible it is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path it tells me who i am what i can become and where i am going it renews my mind changes my heart and refreshes my soul it is my daily bread by faith i'll believe its promises obey its commandments, and honor its principles in my life. With the Bible as my guide, I will walk by faith and not by sight. Please remain standing as I call Pastor Julius to give our message. Good evening. Please uh, turn your Bibles to the book of First Thessalonians. Chapter 2, and we will read uh, verse 9, First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9 this evening is our text. It says, for, for ye remember, brethren, our labor and travail, for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you. We preach unto you the gospel of God. Let's pray. Gracious and loving Father, Lord, we are so thankful, Lord, tonight for this time that we can gather, Lord, once again. We thank you, Father, Lord, for the victory, Lord, that you have given to us today. As uh, our church uh, celebrated, Lord, one of the milestones of one of our ministries, oh God, the 18th foundation of I IBBA, oh God. Lord, we thank you for what you have done uh, over the years through our academy and for what you have done, Father, Lord, uh, through every uh, student that has gone through, Lord, this, this school uh, that we have. And even, Father, Lord, for the contributions made by all our staff. And we also remember, Lord, the, uh, the 
boldness, Lord, of our pastor, Lord, to accept, Lord, the challenge of starting the school 18 years ago. Uh, as we do see, Father, Lord, your hand as uh, they continue, Lord, to unveil now uh, in our school, oh God. And tonight, uh, Lord, we ask that you will uh, bless our meeting tonight. Uh, we thank you, Father, Lord, for uh, the opportunity that we can meet tonight when many churches, Lord, are closing their doors on Sunday night. But Lord, help us, Lord, to always be excited, Lord, to listen to your word. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Please take your seats. Well, before we go on, let's welcome Brother King James back from, from Reno. Okay. I, I trust that uh, our uh, martial arts ministry uh, fared well in, in, our, um, in Reno um, yesterday. And um, we thank the Lord also for the, uh, the special number that the uh, Bautista family rendered. Amen? You know, uh, we mean it because uh, it's really true what Brother Gil said. You know, once you have a loved one who is really dear to your heart, and uh, the Lord uh, removes them from us, you know, you don't forget about them. You, know, you don't forget about them like that. You know. They uh, will always have a special place in in your heart, you know, and uh, especially when uh, you're nearing, uh, uh, like spe their special days, like their birthdays, when you're nearing the holidays, uh, um, the clamor for us to be able to be with them uh, increases, you know. And, uh, you know, my father, um, next year, March, will be his 50th, you know, and it it seems like it was just yesterday. And uh, please say a special prayer for uh, Brother Antonio. Brother Antonio um, uh, was here and before uh, we started our service tonight, uh, he came to me and asked uh, that we pray for him. Um, his uh, supervisor at work is uh, giving him a tough time. And tomorrow, the owner and the supervisor are, uh, or will be meeting with him. Uh, and I told him, just, you know, tell the truth, what happened. There was an incident apparently that happened uh, last Friday and a uh, couple of times before that. Uh, and he feels that his supervisor is uh, becoming, uh, you know, uh, is harassing him and de uh, demeaning him also. So I told him to stick to the truth, tell him uh, what his problem is, uh, also to the owner. And, um, you know... Um, we will move on from that. I told him not to threaten. If ever he uh, is let go, uh, you know, unlawfully, then um, there are also courses that we can take uh, to, to ensure that uh, justice is served. Uh, but tonight, we are reading from the book of First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9. And as we know, uh, as some of us know, the, uh, the book of First Thessalonians is... Uh, a, letter a, letter, a letter written by Paul uh, primarily to um, be able to dispute those people who uh, pretty much uh, accused him that his ministry in uh, Thessalonica was in vain. Um, he ministered to a lot of people and if there was a church uh, known during the ministry of Apostle Paul known for their faith, it was the church in uh, Thessalonica. And tonight, I want to share to you a lesson uh, uh, to give way to uh, the new ministry that's been established in our church by our pastor, which is a spiritual care ministry. And I, I believe um, at least two or three times the pastor had already ministered to us about the spiritual care ministry. And uh, what I'll be sharing with you tonight is the, the approach uh, that we will be having in with, in, in, in addition to what he has already shared with us. So basically what I'll be sharing with you tonight is the uh, practical application as well as um, training in discipleship uh, this evening. So and one of the things that um, I want to, uh, to say to you as I start this message is I want to ask you a question. Uh, and first and foremost, the question is, uh, what do farmers uh, normally do after they uh, prepare the soil and uh, after they uh, prepare the plant uh, and plant, uh, prepare to plant the seed. 
And basically, before any form of uh, sowing and reaping can, can take place, right, there's definitely much work between sowing and reaping. Some of the work that uh, would need to take place are as follows. The farmers, the caretakers, the Bible refers to them in John chapter 15 as the husbandman. They have to do the following. They have to water the seed. They have to protect the crop from the insects. They have to also repel the animals, uh, uh, repel the animals and rodents that would eventually destroy the crops. And uh, the fourth and final thing is that, they, that, that, is that they have to tend the field and also nurture the field for growth. And, you know, planting and also expecting um, fruit to, to, uh, y to be yielded um, is so much like the local church ministry. There is much labor that must take place uh, in order for us to see that the fruit will remain. And the Bible speaks of that in uh, the book of John chapter 15, verse 16. If you go uh, to John chapter 15, verse 16, please, if you, if you will go there with me. Um, and this is the, uh, the reason why we labor. The same way that Paul labored, and the, Bi the Bible referred to, to him as he was someone who travailed. In John chapter 15, verse 16, the Bible says, You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, and that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Um, would you, would you like, if, if ever you are doing some kind of uh, ministerial work, would you? Uh, is it wrong for us to, to, uh, to pray that um, the fruit will remain in whatever we do, we're doing for the Lord? Because um, I believe with, with all my heart that um, it is easier, it's not easy, it's easier said uh, than done when we, when we try to expect um, uh, uh, for us to be able to uh, reap in due time. And one of the necessary ministries in any given church is the work of um, altar dealing and also altar counseling. And after God's word is preached, uh, similarly to what we have encountered this morning and on a given Sunday when the pastor is done preaching, we have an opportunity to minister to those people who would walk down the altar or those people who would just simply kneel down and they need a special, uh, special uh, prayer. And any local church that is investing on the training of altar dealers and visitation workers uh, pretty much have their priorities straight. You know? When you invest in the training of uh, your workers and also your altar dealers, um, that is one of the priorities that must be um, put in place by a local church. Every preacher, every ministry leader, and every Christian worker must be ready and alert to help with the altar work at every service and when called upon to visit. Preachers, Christian workers must come forward during the invitation prayer and watch the pastoral staff for need. I remember when we were starting with our training in, as a preacher at IBBC, that is one of the, um, the things that Pastor Hearn has required for us to get to, uh, used to doing is for him, for us to be able to assist him where, uh, when he's done preaching. And uh, in, in, in fact, in one of the, the, the trainings that we have when we were being trained as a preacher is um, we had actual, uh, like a role play that we, we've done. And what the pastor would normally do is that, in, you know, in a, in, we were, we, you will not always, it will not always be the, the perfect situation or the perfect setting, but normally what uh, you would do is that after the pastor is done preaching, then you would have your altar workers or dealers lined up in the front. And as, as people come forward, of course, uh, female would normally be with females and males dealing with males, of course. And that's how, that's how he would do to us and, or how he trained us. And... You know, it, it does not uh, it does not matter. You know who who who's there to assist.
but primarily he gave the responsibility to the preacher. And you notice in, in our church, we don't have deacons, but we have preachers. We have ministry leaders, we have men, we have faithful women serving uh, in, the, in the ministry of IVBC. But um, in some churches, they have deacons doing the work. But in our church, as, as our pastor explained, the very reason why we want to do away with the, the, the title deacon because of the, uh, the wrong uh, uh, meaning that it, it has carried uh, over the years and its uh, stigma that it carried uh, over the years because um, the, the title deacon tends to um, uh, have a bad taste for, for some churches. In fact, there's a joke, and we've heard it a few times in this pulpit. They no longer call them as the board of deacons, but the board of, you know what? <laughs> and, you know, um, the, the office of the, the deacon is an appointed office in the church. And the one who appoints the, the office of the deacon is none other than but the pastor. But in our church, we, we have done away with that for many years now, for over 10 years. And we just basically have teachers, uh, I mean preachers and Christian workers who are actually doing the work of the deacon, okay? So, in line with what uh, we are studying tonight, any Bible-believing New Testament church must find it advisable to have altar workers trained to work with people who come forward in the services. It's, 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 a, ne it's a necessity in any given ministry. We shouldn't wait for we shouldn't wait for our pastor, we shouldn't wait for the preacher to direct us where we need to go during the service. It should be automatic for, for, for us uh, people who have been trained in this line of work. And uh, those workers that uh, should participate in this part of the service should be well trained. Uh, do you believe that? that? They should be well trained? They should be well instructed and they should also be well disciplined and anointed people or filled with the Holy Spirit. Of course, that, that, that it comes, you know, um, we are not always filled with the Spirit, but that can come when we, we, when we make things right with God. That's when the Holy Spirit will, be, will again fill us and will, He will again empower us to do the work of God. So, in a, in a normal church setting, there are five possible reasons a person may come forward, okay? And the five possible reasons a person may come forward are as follows. Number one, a person may come forward to receive the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. That is one of the, 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 the uh, reasons why a person may come forward to get saved, to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. They had been touched by the gospel message. Okay? They had been convicted by uh, the gospel message as we read about in the book of John chapter 16. And it's the very reason why the Holy Spirit came in order to reprove the world with sin and to bring conviction in the hearts of men. Secondly, another reason a person may come forward is in order for that person to be obedient to the command of scriptural baptism. Okay? Another decision that is to be made uh, when they walk down this aisle is to be obedient to the command of scriptural baptism. Thirdly, uh, to transfer their church membership. You know, possibly this person may have, there's a relocation involved uh, in his life, maybe a uh, migration to, to this country or uh, a transfer of job opportunity in this area. Therefore, he's, they're looking for a, a church of like faith and practice and they happen to find our church. That's why it's so important for us, I believe, God's people as a church, for us to keep our website updated, amen? to keep our website updated because people do visit our website. They want to know more about our church. They want to know where our church is located. And not only to transfer their church membership, but to also rededicate their life to the Lord. You know, and you know, that, that that's not only happen to a visitor, but it can also happen to a fellow believer uh, on a given Sunday. Uh, and lastly, to have someone pray for them. Maybe this person that just came forward is burdened, uh, is, is uh, grieving, discouraged, and suffering from some loss of some kind. So those are the kinds of people that we will be dealing with, you know. And um, 
you, you, you may wonder, you know, Pastor, what, you know, as we know that these are the people that, are, that we will be dealing with, then what are the tools that we need? You know, when we, when we are to, to deal with them, when we get ready to deal with these people. Well, though, of course, when we, when we serve as altar workers and uh, chief servants in, uh, to assist the, the servant of God, what we would need to bring with us, of course, first and foremost, is our King James Bible. Amen? Bring your King James Bible with you. You know, don't, don't try to, to quote verses. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that you don't have that, that ability, but it's best that we, you know, when we are showing them the scriptures, that we have the Word of God in our hands. You know, bring your King James Bible with you, and also uh, please ensure that you uh, have with you a, a writing tool or a pen. You know, I, I normally do not like to, uh, to bring uh, pencils with me because they either break in my pocket, they either poke me, or, you know, when they're filling out a decision card or a visitor's card, it's best that they write it legibly, uh, clearly, uh, on our visitor's card or our decision's card, uh, and it's an information that cannot be erased. Because, you know, after a long time that you, you know, if it's written in pencil, sometimes it can get smeared, and then, you know, next thing you know, you lost the information, the much needed information that, that you need. Also, when serving as a, um, an altar worker, it's important also that we bring decision cards with us. You know, don't, don't try to get the information by memory, you know, but try to write it down, you know, try to fill it out. And you know, when, you're fill it, when a decision card is um, picked up by you, it is best that you or we are the one who will fill it out. Because chances are uh, there uh, a tendency for uh, some prospects, some people that come forward to leave out some details. And later on, you're going to need those details that are blank. So it's important that if as a, an altar worker, we are the one who is actually filling the details uh, for them, ask them what the information is, and then you write it down yourself. And um, another thing that that is also possible for us to be able uh, to, to, to give or to bring with us when we are serving as an altar dealer is a giveaway Bible, especially for those people who, who, get, who get saved. It, it's okay if you don't have the Bible right now, but you, know, you can, you can uh, ask our church office, uh, you can ask uh, Sister Beth or any of our preachers, and we will get one for you, for you to be able to distribute to the person who recently got saved. And right now, in our church, because of the limited space that we have, uh, you know, right now, and that's why let's pray hard that the Lord will give us an opportunity to build a bigger facility for Him. Because when we have a lot of people going to the front, we really don't have much room to deal with them here, in the front, uh, and we just can't bring them anywhere else. We can't. We cannot bring them under the willow tree. We cannot bring them. You know, there's just a lot of noise, a lot of distractions. They need to be play, uh, brought to a place where they can be able to uh, concentrate uh, and listen to the altar dealer, whatever information is being shared with them. So in our church, um, we, you know, we would, maybe if there's only one person or two, two people, maybe we can be able to do it here in our altar. But when it is more than that, it, there's a tendency to get crowded and after the invitation, you know, even when people are making the announcements, people in our church are, are talking. Then that can also be a distraction. So uh, we have a, a, a sign, uh, our classrooms in the trailer, classrooms two and three, uh, as a place where we can bring our uh, person that we are dealing with. Right? If, if you don't know where classrooms two and three are, you go inside the trailer, the first hallway, you go straight, the second hallway, you make a right, you can't miss this, you know? You know, it's not like we have a, a 20, 20 room a school building. You, know, you can't miss it. <laughs> two and three. That's the only <laughs> rooms we got. <laughs> okay? So go to rooms two and three. And uh, we have already assigned one of our staff to make sure that those doors are open, you know, during the time that we are dealing with somebody. Please don't, don't, don't deviate from this because uh, we, we, it doesn't look like we're, uh, uh, we're professional in what we're doing. You see, when, we, when you just take them anywhere else, when you take them behind the storage, you don't take a person <laughs> behind the storage. It is not very inspirational to, to bring somebody behind the storage and you see all this, what kind of church is this? You know, taking me behind, you know, 
they're, they're gonna be scared of you. You think you're gonna put some hurting on them when you put them behind the storage, but bring them to a place where you can look them eye to eye and where you can be able to be with them, just, just be them for, for 10 or 15 minutes, amen? Okay, so that is the, uh, that is the, uh, the first thing that I wanted to sp speak to you. Those are the five possible reasons a person can come forward. We just discussed about the tools needed and the location. Now, we have some, some procedure and protocol to al art altar dealing and also as we deal with people. And, you know, when you first listen to this, you may say, well, Pastor, is that really necessary? You know, you, know, you may laugh at what I'm going to say to you, but this is really important. The following are some suggestions concerning dealing with people at the altar. You need to keep in mind that these suggestions are to be used in the helping of people who have been convicted in the services will come forward at the invitation for a specific reason. Okay? So one of the procedure, one of the protocol that we have, okay, and it's a good habit also to, uh, to get used to, number one is be clean bodily. You say, Pastor, what, what, what's that got to do now with my hygiene? Okay? Be clean bodily. Okay? No other place, no other time will require more intimate contact with people than during the invitation. Okay? If we are one of the altar workers dealing with people, let us be sure that our body is clean. What we mean is that, that necessary deodorant has been used so as not to offend anyone. You know, uh, this, we, we learn all this. You know, you ask Pastor Francis when they learn personal evangelism, they, they cover this too. And I remember this is, all, this is part of the, the physical preparation that we have. As much as it's important for us to have a spiritual preparation, there's also the physical preparation. Okay? You know, if you, don't, if you cannot afford the deodorant, you know, there's a lemon tree <laughs> here in our facility. Okay? If you cannot affo afford a lemon tree, I have a lemon tree at home. You know, let me know. I'll, I'll personally drop by your house and I'll give you a dozen. Okay? Or, or tawas. Okay? You know, for, for our English-speaking uh, brethren, I don't know what Tawas is. I mean, Tawas in, in English. Okay? Number two, if possible, okay? Especially, there's a tendency for our service to, uh, you know, uh, be long at times, you know, because of the message and also the announcements. And sometimes, you know, all the, uh, the uh, there's a lot of things going on in our system. If possible, keep a breath freshener handy. Okay? You know, at the conclusion of the service, just before the invitation song, perhaps place a mint. Let's place a mint in our mouth. Or some kind of breath freshener. If you don't have a breath freshener, please don't use the Lysol spray. Because <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we want you to be alive. You know, we don't want to be calling 911 here. Well, I, you said you wanted my breath to sm smell uh, clean. But a Lysol is not something to be taken internally. Amen? Okay? But, but uh, please, uh, you know, invest on Tic Tac or whatever, you know, um, uh, fresh mint. You know, I, gum is also good, but I don't suggest gum because you cannot, you cannot really uh, communicate clearly when you have gum and it's also not proper, especially when you are here, you know. Uh, yes, Mr. Ben. Or you swallow it. Okay. Yeah, it's it's your preference as long as you know, you know you 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 uh, meet the requirements to keep our uh, breath fresh when we are dealing with that person. You know, we will be. The reason to that is the logic to that is we will be talking in uh, in close contact with people, and let us not be offensive in any way, especially concerning our breath. You know, when when we're trying to witness to somebody, you know. They're not looking at you, not because they don't like you. You know, <laughs> did it ever occur to us? Maybe, perhaps, you know, they they cannot tolerate the what's coming out of our mouth. You see, you know, in in, in, in the, uh, the morning, you know, I, I I remember when we didn't have any any children yet, and uh, my wife and I went to Virginia Beach, and we were on our way home um, Sunday night. Then all of a sudden, we see these people. Inside the plane, they all covered their nose. 
And then next thing to that, we covered our nose as well. And next thing you know, we looked back, there was this Filipino couple in the back and they were eating pusit. <laughs> Squid. And, uh, you know, when you, when you plan to be an altar worker, please, you know, refrain from those type of food. Okay? You know, uh, if you think, oh, you know, it's going to go away after listening to the message 40 minutes, it will not go away unless you do something about it. Okay? And um, when we are getting ready to, to talk to the person, let us also get into the habit of introducing ourselves and speak a word of greeting. You know, many times, you know, we, we, we are uh, we, out of our goodness of our heart. Yes, we are there to, to assist the person, but, you know, we are the difference between you and that person, like three steps, you're leaving them behind. They don't know where to go. You make sure that you, you guide them with you. And you introduce yourself, you tell them, my name is John Smith. Then you tell them, I'm so glad that you're here today. Okay, and then if they, if they say, and then you move on, carry out the conversation, and you ask them, how, 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 may, how may I assist you today? Or how may I help you today? Okay, that's also uh, one way of starting the conversation with the person. Okay, so those are the, uh, one of the uh, procedures and protocols that, uh, three of the procedures and protocols that, we should get used to uh, in our activity. Okay. Now, if the person, um, as I said earlier, one of the reasons is if the person comes forward to receive Christ as their Savior, okay, one of the, the habits that we should get into as altar dealers is for us to uh, be patient. You say, Pastor, why, why is it that we, we are required to be patient? Because we have a tendency as altar dealers and Christian workers, uh, and we have this feeling as if uh, we have to go back to the church building right away and present this person for that they made a public profession of faith. You know, that is only second, not, not as important as seeing the person say, get saved or seeing the person make the proper decision. And uh, as we, we come to the point where a person comes to... Uh, to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and personal Savior, uh, if the, the gospel wasn't presented by the speaker, okay, and we, we have visitors in our church, many times you know, they would preach uh, something from the Bible and they would not give an invitation, but somebody, somehow they want to receive the person, they want to receive the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then our first approach as an altar worker or dealer, Christian worker, is for us to present the gospel once again. But you know, if they heard the gospel, if you know that the gospel was presented, you don't have to present the gospel all over again. But you, you lead them straight to uh, the sinner's prayer. And then you try to confirm, you know, wh why did you come forward? And then if they tell you, uh, I, w I wanted to come forward because I wanted to receive the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, my Savior. Then, then you ask some, some questions, diagnostic questions, that will help us understand, you know, why... Uh, that person is trying to make that decision. And if they, their answer is satisfactory, it is according to the word of God, then you go straight to uh, leading that person to the sinner's prayer. And um, I don't know, you know, if you, uh, you know, for those of you uh, uh, Christian workers here, do you have your own uh, way to lead a person to the sinner's prayer? Do you, do you know how to lead a person to the sinner's prayer? Raise your hand if you do. Okay. If, who, who, of you do, who of you don't? Well, I saw some hands you didn't raise, so <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not going to argue with you. But if the, if the gospel wasn't presented, give a clear presentation of the gospel. And normally, you know, we have our, our ways of, of uh, presenting the gospel. Some, some of you who were exposed to the um, evangelism explosion, you would use uh, the four spiritual laws. Uh, many of us, most of us, would use the Roman road or uh, the David Wood, but don't use all 13 steps. Okay, if you use all 13 steps, you know, it would already be time for the evening service. Okay? So, what I would normally do, I, I just want to run this by very quickly, but what I would normally do when I'm leading a person to Christ during the, the time of the invitation or when the pastor's given the invitation and we're in a place would normally use uh, 
Isaiah chapter 53, verse 6. That's one of the verses that I would normally use. And the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 6, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. And of course, the second thing, we, we basically point out that we are lost apart from the presence of God. Uh, we are lost without a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are a lost sinner, but because Jesus bore our sins on the cross, um, the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25, the second verse that I would normally show them is Hebrews 7, 25, where it says, Wherefore, the Bible says, He is able save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. So when I, when I share, them, uh, share with them Hebrews 7 20, 25 I normally would tell them that the Lord Jesus Christ has all the power to save us from our sin. That's basically a very brief and uh, clear cut explanation of what Hebrews 7 25 is that Jesus Christ has all the power to save us from our sin. And uh, it's important that we tell the person, tell the person, him or her, that no one or nothing else can save them from their sin. That's why the Bible says the Lord Jesus Christ can save us from the other okay, that come to God by him. And then the third verse I would normally use is uh, Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, and Romans chapter in verse 13. Right? So the first verse that I would normally use, it all depends. You can be creative, use the Roman road if you want, the four spiritual laws, um, David Wood's uh, Operation Goal Steps uh, 5 uh, to 8, or you can use uh, what I'm sharing with you right now. First use Isaiah 53, 6, then Hebrews 7, 25, and then Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10, and verse 13. You know, tell him that there is a great need for, for a person to repent of his sins. And you know, it said, you know, repentant. You know, we, we try to explain to them what repentant is. What is repentance? Repentance is the change of heart and mind towards God and sin. You know, before we got saved, the reason why we need to have a change of heart and mind towards God and sin, before we got saved, we love sin. Before... <coughs> We got saved, we despise the name of God. That's why it's important for us to point out what needs to take place. Okay? Before we, we get saved, that we need to repent of our sins. We need to ask the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of our sins. And we need to reiterate to the person uh, that the person needs to ask the Lord Jesus Christ for forgiveness of his sins. And he needs to receive Christ in his life as his Lord and personal Savior. That's why we, uh, after, after the person says that he or she is ready to receive Christ, then that is the time that we lead them to the sinner's prayer. Okay? You know, and it's up to you, you know, um, uh, some, some people would normally um, write the sinner's prayer in the back of their Bible, should there be an occasion for them to, to use it um, in, a, in a given time or place. Um, it wouldn't hurt that you, uh, you have a way uh, to present the sinner's prayer uh, systematically. And just as important also, uh, we cannot be able to avoid the, uh, the opportunity when we are presenting the gospel to somebody uh, whose uh, language or w where, where English is their second language only. When we are presented with that opportunity, it's important that we are especially cautious to make sure that the person understands our gospel presentation. That you know, they're not uh, only making the decision because they want to get rid of us. You know, many now, nowadays we are exposed in a belief known as easy uh, believism. And many people, you know, would, would, uh, would uh, be satisfied by that. As long as a person makes that prayer and agrees with them, then they're fine with that without truly understanding whether the person understood, you know, what they're being dealt with. You know, it's important that we really invest, invest the time. It's important that we also do it cautiously, especially with people 
uh, whose language is not uh, English uh, primarily. And you know, we live in a place, uh, in an area, where it's 60% predominantly Hispanic. You know, and uh, many of them um, uh, do not speak English um, uh, that well, but they understand. But it's important that we uh, repeat some important matters to them to help them ensure that they understood us completely. Now, after we lead a person to the sinner's prayer, you ever wondered what's next? What, ne what is the next thing to, course of, what is our course of action after we lead a person to Christ, after they, um, they say the sinner's prayer uh, with us? Richard Ben. Make public profession of faith. That's, that's what we would normally do in our church. When, when, we, when the person finally makes a uh, decision and they receive the Lord Jesus Christ sincerely in their heart as their Savior, then that is the time that we, we present them to the church. And the very reason why we present them to the, to the church, it's important for them to be able to see that people, believers, rejoice in their decision. Okay? Because if there's any group of people who will understand what just happened in their life, are those people who are serving as witness of the, uh, the public profession of faith. Because they will be the ones who will be praying for that person. You know, uh, I, for example, would pray for a person if, if somebody came forward tonight and, and got saved. I personally would pray for that person, that that person would, would remain in the faith. Amen? That that person would also follow the Lord Jesus Christ in the ordinance of baptism. And then, you know, of course, we cannot be able to accomplish everything uh, at once, uh, one uh, uh, seating. So uh, the next uh, course of action that we ought to take when, once a person gets saved is probably um, um, carry out a conversation with them and, and ask them uh, the possibility that we can be able to visit, visit them or go to their place of residence uh, some other time. Because there are still a lot of business to, for us to, to carry on with them. Like I said, you know, we cannot expect a person to, to get saved and for them to fully understand everything. And then the following Sunday, come to church, get baptized, and then remain faithful. Just like everyone else. It takes time. There is some, some efforts that we need to exert in order to see that it happens. So... Uh, if ever they, they say, well, you know, I cannot be able to make it uh, this week or next week, but don't give them any reason to refuse your invitation. But if they cannot be able to, uh, to make it this week or the following week, um, uh, try to uh, be, uh, be flexible enough to adjust to when their next availability will be. And in the next time that you have the opportunity to speak with them, of course, you ask them about their experience, their visit to the church, their experience, whether they, they remember the decision that they just made. Right? You ask them whether they remember um, if, they, uh, if they have been saved or not. And um, chances are, if they were really sincere about the decision they made, they will understand, they will understand what um, you're talking to them about. You know, trust me. So. In, in, that, in that second meeting that we have with them, okay, to help them uh, understand what they have just experienced, okay, ask the person this following question. Okay? You tell them, I do not know your heart. Only God knows how sincere when you prayed last week, last month, two days ago. Um, then ask them this question. Where then is Christ now after you receive him. Okay. Where then is Christ now after you receive him? And you know, if that person was not paying attention, he or she will give you an array of answers. Okay, he will tell you, uh, you know, in heaven. Okay. Yes, technically he's in heaven, but you know, if they understood and I remember what, what transpired in their life, they would tell you, I receive him in my heart. You know, and uh, ask them, did you really ask Jesus for forgiveness? Okay. And then they will tell you, you know, of course, we cannot, we cannot uh, tell whether their heart was sincere, but we can just uh, take their answer as a grain of salt. And then the next thing, after asking those diagnostic questions to help them understand, um, 
where, they're, um, where, they, where they are spiritually, that is when we come in and give him the assurance of salvation. Okay, what, what are, what are the uh, uh, verses of assurance of salvation? Let me give you four of them that you can be able to use if you want to write them down this evening. Okay? You can be able to use John chapter 1, verse 12 as one of the verses. You tell them, in John chapter 1, verse 12, we don't have the time to read all those verses, but if you read it to them, after you read it to them, you tell them that you have become a child of God. That's one of the benefits that they, they have actually received when they receive Christ as their Savior, is that they have become a child of God. Another verse is found in John chapter 5, verse 24. Okay? And, and there in that verse, you can, you can tell them that when the moment they receive the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, they've also received everlasting life. Okay? And then, in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, because they have received Christ and they have accepted Christ in their heart as their Savior, the Bible says they are no longer condemned. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. And then, the fourth verse, um, John chapter 10, verse 28. The Bible says, And I give unto them eternal life. Neither shall they perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. You know, you tell them that's how secure is. Okay? How secure our salvation is in Christ. That nothing will, will be able to remove us from the, from the hand of God. You know, if you even want to go uh, even further, you can go to Romans chapter 8, verses 35 to 39, telling them that Nothing shall be able to separate us from the love of God. And it goes on from death to all these things. But not even those things can be able to separate us from the love of God. Okay? And then, you know, you can, you know, um, it's up to you if you want to give them more. Okay? But um, this, this would, these verses would do, it, would do for now. You know, and the key thing is for us to be able to explain it to them and how important these verses are for them to know that they are now in Christ. Um, thirdly, now we are now on the subject of uh, giving them the assurance of salvation and the follow visit. Um, tell the person now that he is now a child of God and that he should love God with all his heart. That is now what, what God requires from him. Matthew chapter 22, <laughs> verses 37 and 38. Again, uh, I don't expect you to ne necessarily follow this book, uh, book by book or uh, uh, religiously, but you can have your own style, but I'm just using this as guide to, uh, to help um, God's people tonight. Okay? Third thing, tell him that now that he is a child of God should, and should love God with all his heart. Matthew 22, 37 and 38. And because the better reason why I believe this is important, this verse particularly is very important because the first evidence of his love is his obedience to the Lord in baptism. You know, if he truly loves the Lord, okay, and uh, evidence of his love is obedience. And if he loves the Lord and he wants to obey the Lord, then he will follow the Lord in uh, the ordinance of baptism. And we can find uh, we can find that in Acts chapter two, verse forty-one, Acts two forty-one, and Romans chapter six, verse four. Okay, and you know, in your visit also with them, if you did not get an opportunity to to give them a Bible during their uh, the day that they got saved, somehow they were like in a hurry. Uh, make sure that you have um, um, a Bible with you that you will leave with them. Okay? A Bible that you would leave with them. And um, normally, um, when we have a, uh, we're giving instructions to them, because uh, not, not all the time that we're going to be with them, but we try to, to guide them as far as what book in the Bible they should start reading. Okay? Somebody said, well, pastor, maybe we lead them to the book of Numbers. Okay? <laughs> you know, if, if you want them to have a, an, a, a better taste of, of Bible reading, don't lead them to the book of Numbers. Okay? But rather lead them to the book of First John first. First John uh, would be a, uh, an appropriate book to start with. That is how I got started. My, my, the instruction that was given to me by the one discipling me was read the book of First John. And then work my way to the book of John, okay? And then um, followed a uh, systematic way of reading the Bible. But First John would be the ideal place, or the book of John is also uh, a good place to start. 
Okay. Um, when we when we are uh, dealing with a person in uh, in our follow-up visit, make sure that you tell them that you're only going to be there. You, you just need 10 or 15 minutes of their time. Make sure that you stick to your commitment. Don't overstay. Okay. If you if you notice that they're cooking lunch, and you have you there's still 30 minutes to go, but you only have five minutes. Uh, don't don't take your time. Okay. Because they, they may not want you to be around during lunchtime, right? But uh, stick to your commitment with them. If you tell them 10 minutes, then by all means, just stay there for 10 minutes. You know, because the person has heard the gospel already, he has responded to the message already, then uh, he, need, he simply needs to have the assurance of salvation. And another thing, when we are visiting with them, as much as, you know, we, we like to share the Bible with them, don't... Um, Give them too many scriptures. Okay, just maybe you know if you want to give them assurance of salvation, give them two at most. And if you know if you want to stretch it a little bit, three. But don't 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 overdo it, because then you don't want to to shove all these truths into into their uh, uh, finite minds uh, all at once. You know, we can only take so much uh, uh, information. Amen. Okay, so if the person now. Okay. came forward to obey Christ in the command of baptism. Okay. So it's important, before I go to the command of baptism, it's important that when a person makes a decision, whether it's a first-time guest, whether it's somebody who's doubting their salvation, it's important for us, they are what we call, they are what we call, consider as a warm prospect. Okay. Which means that they have to be visited within the week. They have to be visited within the week. They have to, if, 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 if opportunity will allow us, you know, uh, if we are uh, available, visit them the following day. Okay? But they are the ones who need to be visited within, uh, within the week. Okay? So now, the second uh, scenario now is the person came forward to obey Christ in the command of baptism. Okay? It's important that we, we are clear on this because there's very much confusion, confusion uh, abounding today regarding scriptural baptism. Okay? Um, that's why it's very important that those people explaining baptism uh, understand uh, the doctrine of baptism themselves. You know, uh, the word baptism is actually seen uh, 100 times in the New Testament, exactly 100 times. And um, the, our first knowledge of uh, the word baptism in the Bible uh, is nowhere to be found in the Old Testament, but it is found uh, during the ministry of John the Baptist and how John the Baptist um, uh, preached to the Jews, and how he um, encouraged them to turn from their sin to God. And um, it's important that we, we uh, explain to them baptism because baptism is so important because it's, it's an opportunity uh, for them to be able to demonstrate their genuineness of their uh, changed heart in God. That is one of the, one of the, uh, the, the genuine manifestation that a person was a follower of Christ in the first century church. Now, you know, nowadays, people are very casual about baptism. Many people even wait for weeks and even months. Others would tell you, Pastor, I need to pray about it. My advice to them, you don't really need to pray for it because it's the will of God. It's already in the scriptures. It's written all over. Okay? But, uh, of course, um, we don't want to force them, but we want to compel them to make a spiritual decision right away, especially in the area of baptism. And uh, in the first century church, if you say that I'm a follower of Christ, they don't believe you. They, they don't believe that, that person right away. But the way for you to really prove the genuineness of your changed heart in Christ is if you obey the Lord Jesus Christ and the ordinance of baptism. Because in the first century church, if you obey the Lord Jesus Christ and the ordinance of baptism, there are some stipulations that will happen. There are some things that happen. You can either be disowned by your family. You can be you know, cast out from the community because that is, that is how the world viewed the Lord Jesus Christ even as early as the first century. And, you know, uh, baptism is one of the genuine manifestations of a changed heart in Christ. 
Okay? So, when explaining baptism to the person, okay, let us tell the person okay, that if salvation or new birth is the doorway to eternal life, then you tell them that baptism is the doorway into the membership of a church. Okay? It is the doorway to the membership of a church. Okay? We explain to them the following. Okay? That if they, if they become the child of God, it is not just enough for a person to know that he is saved. But he must also obey Christ's commands to every Christian. And the most basic form of command given to a Christian is to obey Christ in the ordinance of baptism. Okay? So, now, if ever they ask you, pastor, preacher, ma'am, why should a Christian be baptized? Okay? Now, this is now the logic. Why they need to be baptized. Number one, because it is a command. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. Number two, because the Lord Jesus Christ himself was an example. Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 to 17. Okay? Number three, you tell them because it's an answer of a good conscience toward God. It is the symbol of obedience. First Peter chapter 3, verse 21. It's the answer of good conscience toward God. Okay? Number four, because it's a requirement for church membership. Okay? And Acts chapter 2, verse 41, and they that gladly received his word were baptized. Okay, and in the same day, 3,000 souls were added to the church. And you see, brethren, um, it's important for us to explain that baptism is a doorway to church membership because church membership is very important. No work for the Lord is legitimate. No work for the Lord is rightful, valid, apart from the ministry of the local church. That's why the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 21, unto him be glory in the church. It is only the work that we do in the church that will fully, fully um, glorify our Lord and our Master. Because if there is any institution, any organization that was given the marching orders, that was given the mandate to do the work of the church, is his people. You know, and if we are if we are not part of the body, then it's like um, a soldier. We call ourselves a soldier, but we don't belong to any army. Or a uh, uh, a, um, a you know many things like that. But as God's people, it's important for us to to tell them that uh, it's important for us to be connected to the local church. That we we do it through the. To the, through the ministry of the local church, whatever we are trying to do. So, why should a Christian be baptized? By way of review, because it's a command. Matthew 28, 19, because Jesus became the example. Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 to 17. Because it's an answer of good conscience toward God. It's a symbol of obedience. 1 Peter 3, 21. Because it's a requirement for church membership. Acts chapter 2, verse 41. And... Church membership is important because it's the only institution that God recognizes uh, where our efforts will be valid because we need to be connected to the ministry of the local church. Now, uh, before, uh, before we, we baptize somebody, there's also what we call the prerequisites or the requirements for scriptural baptism. And what are they? Okay. What are the, the four requirements or prerequisites for scriptural baptism? Number one. You need to be first and foremost be the proper candidate. For you to become the proper candidate, you need to be saved. You need to have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 2, verse 41. Okay, and the proper mode. The proper mode. Okay, the proper mode is immersion only. Colossians chapter 2, verse 12. Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 to 17. And you know, when you, when you go back to the to the Greek word uh, of the word uh, ba uh, baptize. It came from the Greek word baptizo, which means to dip to, or to submerge. Okay? You know, and there are, of course, other forms of baptism. Just like the baptism that uh, I received in the Roman Catholic Church when I was an infant. 
and also the way that um, um, the Mormons would baptize uh, the dead is they, they would either sprinkle or pour, okay? And when you know when you when you when you pour, it is no longer baptism, but rather it's rantiso, which is pouring. It's that's totally different, okay? Totally different. That's why you know uh, in, in our church, I praise God that we we have purchased this. Because, you know, this, this talks about, you know, of course, baptism does not save, okay? But it is the picture that it paints that, we, that will bring a person to Christ. And in this case, we need to remember that the proper mode of baptism is only through immersion. You know, many times in our ministry, in our church, when we didn't have our own building yet, and when we didn't have our own baptistry, we baptize people in the bathtub, we baptize people in the jacuzzi. I got baptized in the jacuzzi. You see, uh, we baptize people in the river. We also baptize people in the beach. Now, I don't know how many of you got baptized in, in the river. We even had a member before, and pastor was asking, how come you don't want to get baptized? He said, pastor, I want to get baptized at the Jordan River. <laughs> you know, pretty costly, you know, to, to go over there. But we eventually baptized her at the beach, okay? And she was uh, half uh, happy, half as happy as being baptized. But the main thing is she obeyed uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the proper message. Okay? Uh, unlike uh, unlike uh, the Roman Catholic Church, the, the message for, for salvation or for baptism is it adds grace to the individual. It helps them to be able to uh, earn merit before the Holy God. But the proper message of baptism, as the Bible talks about in Romans 6, 3 to 5, is the message it carries is it is an identification or a message of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why you notice, you know, you've, you've seen Pastor Francis baptized many times, and the pastor, myself, and, and some others. You know, um, when we are uh, lowering the person into the baptistry or the tub or whatever form of uh, 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 water it is, uh, that we, uh, when we're lowering them, it's actually depicting the... Uh, the death and the burial of the Lord Jesus Christ. But as we bring them back out of the water, that is a picture of uh, their new life in Christ. Okay? Uh, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is also being painted as we are lifting them out of the baptistry. See? Uh, that's, and that's the proper message of baptism and why we believe in that. Romans chapter 6, verses 3 to 5. And then uh, the last requirement or prerequisite is the proper authority. The proper authority is, is where um, it really differs uh, among many churches, okay? Because um, the, this proper authority must be channeled through the local church. And not just any local church, but it must be based on the baptism by John the Baptist. Amen? That's why we believe tonight as a church that the Lord Jesus Christ is a Baptist. Because the baptism that he had was John. And you know, when you, are, when you have received the, the Baptist baptism, it speaks about your function. It's a functional name, meaning to say that we baptize believers. Okay? It me means to say that we cannot be able to reverse the order. We cannot say, uh, get baptized and then you'll be saved. It's the other way around. You have to be saved first before you get baptized. It has to carry the right message, and at the same time, it must also carry the proper authority. Okay? That's why, you know, uh, how many times have we seen people get rebaptized in, in our church? You know, I remember when, uh, when we were following up the, the Leiva family. You know, it's, it, took a, it took a while for, for us to, to really get them to come to our church. They were praying about uh, the Lord's leading in, in their life, and it took almost six weeks to have them to, to, to make a decision to follow the Lord Jesus Christ in the ordinance of baptism. Because if there's one thing that, that preacher Gabe could not, could not understand is why does he have to be rebaptized all over again? You see, so I had, I had to explain to him, you know, back in the days when they lived in Hayward, I had to explain to him the very reason why. And you know, I prayed really hard. I, I shared with Pastor Hernandez. I got some advice from him. And eventually, the Lord touched his heart, touched his wife's heart, and 
you know, they got rebaptized and became a member of our church. So praise God for that. You see? So as God's people, uh, before we baptize somebody, it doesn't hurt that if we would uh, take the opportunity to listen to the testimony of the candidate. You know, sometimes, you know, a person may have forgotten uh, why they're being baptized. Maybe they said, well, you know, I, I want to get baptized because I want to be saved. You know, that's the wrong, wrong idea. You know, it's important that we listen to their testimony, that they truly understand what they're doing. And, you know, normally if, it, if their answer to us is satisfactory, uh, by all means, you know, we will not delay their baptism, but we will proceed. And in our church right now, we have, of course, we have the House of Dorcas, um, uh, who is in charge of assisting not only the preparation of our Lord's table, but also in assisting our uh, uh, dismal candidates. But of course, um, sometimes it can get a little uneasy when you have a female and assist assisting a male. You know what I mean? So uh, in our church, you know, we have no problem of the House of Dorcas uh, preparing uh, the Lord's table, but in assisting the uh, the Baptist, and you know, we have to provide a few things to the baptismal candidate. We have to provide a gown, okay? We have to also provide a towel, okay? So we need to have those handy, uh, House of Dorcas. And at the same time, uh, we need to have a designated restroom where we, where we can um, have them uh, change before and after. And this is only an experience and suggestion because uh, it happened when we had one baptismal candidate uh, uh, got changed in the restroom trailer and the floor was all wet. You know, we are not so much concerned about the floor, but more importantly, the safety of those who will get into that room and having finding the room being, or the restroom, finding it completely wet and with water. So please, for those, for those uh, uh, church members who are assisting our baptismal candidate, let's um, set this in place that if ever we are going to guide them to get changed before and after, let us use the restroom that we have in the dojo. That, that, that is a, there's a special reason why it's designed like that. Uh, our man, Brother Gil, did that. The shower there is for them to be able to change. Amen? And, and you know, I, if, if there's anything that, that uh, I want to suggest also to our church is that we, we also assign uh, another group that would assist our male uh, baptismal candidates because of course sometimes it's an easy for our for our um, females to assist male ones that's why it's important that we communicate amongst ourselves you see when there is a Lord's Supper that is to take place when there's a baptism that is to take place there must be a communication you know we will see to it that Pastor Herdes myself Pastor Francis will communicate to you our preachers that we have a scheduled baptism we will ensure that um, you know, there will not be any cause for delay. But at the same time, let us provide what is needed. Let us provide the proper place where we can prep them up for the baptism because sometimes that can be a, that can be a hindrance, that can be a snag to the whole process and eventually um, uh, possibly discouraging the baptismal candidate. So, you know, re remind me, re remind Pastor Francis and I that we, we will get somebody to help our male baptismal uh, Candidates, you know, we it is it doesn't look uh, uh, very presentable that we as a church assigning somebody who will help them right at that moment. We we need to have somebody who would help them even before, you know, uh, a week before or a scheduled so that they can also prepare uh, themselves. Okay, uh, if you have any questions, you you may you may freely um, freely ask me after the service. So last and but not least, okay. If the person came forward to transfer their membership to ours, okay, ask them first and foremost to relate, to share their salvation testimony. Okay? Because sometimes, you know, if they want to move their membership to our church and their salvation testimony is shaky, then before we can accept their transfer of membership, we need to share with them the gospel first. Amen? And, you know, we believe that the reception of new members into the church is one of the most vital, one of the most important aspects of altar work being done in the church, a reception of these new members. Member, membership transfers are normally handled by a more experienced church staff. 
You know, I'm not saying that not everybody can be able to do the job, cannot be able to handle, doesn't have the skill to, to do the job. But it, it is because uh, important that a church staff be prepared to ask questions at the membership interview. You know, we have to ask questions, like, like what we are asked to do when missionaries are visiting our church. We have to ask them, you know, what, what are, affiliation are you with? Okay. Give, me, give us your salvation testimony. You know, give us the, the name of your church. So, so we do a little research. We don't just ask anybody, you know, to come to our church and, and preach here at this pulpit. You know, we're very careful and, and we're, we screen those people who, who come to our church. So it's very important that we ask these person, people that are uh, planning, contemplating on transferring their church membership, what their church affiliation is, to make sure that it is the church of like faith and practice, okay? Uh, is it a church of like faith and practice? Is it good enough? Uh, it, it is not good enough that the church is a Baptist because there are a lot of many, there are many kinds of Baptist groups and churches. You see, if they belong to a Southern Baptist church, we have to rebaptize them again. You know, there's what we call the American Baptist. There is the denominational Baptist. There is the fundamental Baptist. There is the independent Baptist. You know, if they're fundamental, independent, then we are fine with that. But if they belong to the Southern, the American, the denominational, then we may have to baptize them again because they have a different authority than ours. You see, Con confirm whether their baptism is proper. You know, and don't forget when they are contemplating on moving their membership to our to our church. Give them a compliment for making a right decision. Give them a compliment. Tell them that it's great to know that he can continue to be taught, to fellowship with Christians in prayer and in worship, to, and to continue to grow in grace and maturity and be established in the faith. Very important, you know, that the, how you welcome their decision, how you appreciate it, and how the church appreciate it. And, you know, the Bible uh, speaks of that. Acts chapter 2, verses 46 and 47. You know, tell him that uh, when they're mo transferring their membership that uh, this is now going to be their, their new home, their new, new storehouse of their tithes, their offering, and also their gifts. Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. Okay? And tell him what, that he is now entitled to new privileges. And that, that cannot happen until they, 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 they transfer their membership uh, to the church um, formally. Okay? And um, if a person came forward to rededicate their life, you know, I would encourage the person to, to uh, you know, um, to confess their sin to God before giving their life to God uh, again. First John chapter one verse ten. You know, we find those uh, those kind of people coming to our church. You know, they will walk in. You know, they are distraught, they're downfounded, and you know, they just said, "Well, Pastor, you know, I want to rededicate my life. Then, what is our course of action? We need to get right with God." First John chapter one verse nine, and pray with them. You see, um, if the the person came forward for special prayer, you know you, you may ask what the prayer is for, but be be very careful, because this will help us understand what we are praying for. That's why you know I have a, a list with me some scriptures that we can use to give others in time of need. You know, um, we don't always have all the answers. But it's good if we have like a, like a cheat sheet in the back of our Bible where we can, you know, direct them if they have any, any special questions, you know. If they're tempted, if they're persecuted, they're facing trials, you know. Like, you know, if when you, like this afternoon when I was talking to Brother Antonio, I, I shared with him a couple of scriptures where he can turn to that will try to get him uh, through the night as he tries to uh, prepare for his meeting with his supervisor and boss tomorrow. So... There's an array of things that we can share. You know, there's always a room for, for, for us to be able to improve. But uh, if we would not talk about this, if we would not train, if we would not avail ourselves, then um, uh, we would not be able to see uh, uh, the harvest just as soon as we would expect it to be. It would take a little longer than the usual. But if we receive the proper training as a church, and like I said this morning, you know, the church gives us uh, all this opportunity, not only to grow, to train, but to also prepare us for the equipping uh, and the doing of our ministry. And it's up to us, you know, whether we want to embrace and take the challenge uh, 
on our shoulders as, uh, as people of God. So tonight, uh, I don't know how, how many of us uh, who are present tonight have signed up to the spiritual care ministry. I, I do not know uh, by memory who, who signed up and who didn't. But I trust that those of you who, uh, who, are, who are here tonight, this is the first leg of our training. There's, there's more that I will share with you, some practical um, uh, lessons that I will be sharing with you. And moving forward, I will also share with you how we can be able to visit people in the hospital, okay? and how we uh, uh, minister to a person who is dying, you know, uh, and, and things like that. So that when the opportunity arrives, you know, we would not be just biting our nails, but we know that the Lord has called us, and there's a reason why we were prepared for that. God bless you. Let's all stand, please. Well, every hands be bowed and every eyes be closed. No one knows him tonight. We have our invitation. I couldn't thank the Lord enough for this opportunity that I can share with you. I do not call myself as an expert in this field, but I'm just like a, I'm just a learner like you. you know, I did not arrive at this point in my Christian life without going through the same process that most of us have gone through and the leaders of our church are not going to ask you to do anything that we wouldn't do ourselves. Okay? If there's anything, we will serve ourselves as example to what we would ask of you to do. But if there's anyone here tonight, maybe you're here tonight and uh, maybe you're still um, questioning what is really the um, what the Lord's will is in your life at the moment. Um, I'm pretty sure that it wouldn't hurt if you ask the Lord tonight, Lord, are you uh, leading me or steering me towards becoming one of the uh, church workers of our church, possibly be, in, be involved in the follow-up ministry, possibly be involved in um, the altar dealing ministry of our church. You know, it, it wouldn't hurt to have an extra body or two in these areas. Somebody who would really commit and dedicate their lives into learning the art of this ministry because we need some good people. We need good and faithful people who will who will help us in this ministry. Uh, don't ever say that, Pastor, you know, I think the Lord is done with me. I, I tried to look everyone everywhere else, but I have pretty much done everything that I want. I don't really know where I don't really know where my niche is in this church. But I want to encourage you, my dear beloved brother or sister tonight, that if there is a, a ministry that I encourage you to, to pray for, for involvement in the in the future, is pray that the Lord will will melt our heart to become one of the soul winners in our church. You know, there it wouldn't hurt for us to have an additional body in this ministry of our church. Somebody who will point an elderly, somebody who will point a middle age, a teenager, or a young child to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, what saddens me, and I'm pretty sure it also saddens some, some of our leaders, is that almost every week we hear testimonies of people giving soul winning testimonies, hoping that these testimonies will truly stir the heart of God's people, those listening to these testimonies. But what, what is ironic is, on a weekly basis, we see the same people going out. We share the same people having the same burden. What has happened? Does that mean that the tes testimony fell on deaf ears? No, I don't think so. Does that mean that um, nobody's listening? I believe it's just a matter of obeying. Maybe you're here tonight. I am not going to ask you to raise your hand. But maybe the Lord spoke to you tonight. Maybe there's a ministry that the Lord just put in your heart right now. And said, I'm going to make you good at this. I want you to be one of them. I want you to obey me in this ministry. If the Lord has spoken to you tonight, will you come? Who will be the first one? Who will be the first one? Not only that our church is in need of soul winners, but how about people who will follow up? You ever wonder why people who visit our church, people who 
once attending our church fall through the cracks because we're lacking. We're lacking bodies that will go back to them and try to find out how, how they're doing, to follow up with them. Our leaders can only do so much with already the responsibility that are given to them. But we need new people who will take this challenge upon their shoulders tonight. If God has spoken to you tonight, will you come? Is there anybody there? I know that this message will not return to God, to God uh, void, but I know that there's somebody here whom God has spoken to. If it's your desire that the Lord will use you greatly and tremendously in this ministry, then you may kneel where you are, you may come to the front. Don't be afraid of the challenge. But if God has placed that burden in your heart, if God has called you, He will equip you. He will equip us. That's a promise. We are actually the answer to our own prayers. As we can see in the Lord's statement in Matthew chapter 9. And He said, Pray ye therefore that the Lord of harvest shall send forth laborers. See, brethren, there's no time to, for us to waste. The, har uh, the harvest and the field are ready. It is uh, ripe for harvest. And if the harvest will not be received accordingly in a timely manner, it will rot. The other groups, the other organizations will take advantage of the harvest. Let us not allow that. Let us not allow our passiveness. Let us not allow our disobedient, disobedience. Let us also not allow anything else to neglect them. Let us pray. Father, Lord in heaven, we know, Father, that as your children tonight, we are grateful, Lord, for any contribution, any effort that is rendered, Lord, by any of our church members, especially, Father, Lord, in the ministry, Lord, of our church. Father, Lord, it is our prayer tonight that you will continue, Lord, to speak to, to our heart. Lord, help us, Lord, to be able to see the need uh, like how you see the need, Lord, in our church. Help us, Father, Lord, not to, not to turn uh, the other way when we see, Father, Lord, a need in our church. But help us, Father, Lord, to to have, Lord, a pioneering spirit. Help us, Father, Lord, to have the desire, Lord, in our heart to do something in what we see, Lord, is deficient among, Lord, in, uh, in any, Lord, of our ministries. Lord, help us, Lord, that we will have the spirit, Lord, where we will not wait to be told. But, Father, Lord, as your people, as your servant, as those of us who have been called into the leadership position, and even, Father, Lord, in the service of the Lord, that we would, Father Lord, take the lead to make sure, Father Lord, that we address uh, the need uh, that our church has. Lord, it is our prayer that we will be a blessing to you, Lord, that we will always put a smile, Lord, in your face. And Father Lord, we know that nothing, uh, nothing puts a, a smile in your face other than Lord, the, the obedience, Lord, of your people, oh God. And Lord, it is our prayer that you will continue, Lord, to make us strong. Continue, Lord, to equip us, Lord, that we may be able to fulfill the marching orders of the church that you have given to us. Thank you, Father, Lord, for the leadership of our pastor, Lord, and for the many laborers, Lord, co-laborers, Lord, that we have in this church, men and women, uh, young adults, teenagers, and even children, Lord, who are laboring with us. Father, Lord, tonight, we pray, Lord, that you would dismiss us, Father, Lord, with thy blessing. And thank you, Lord, for everything. For in Jesus' name, Lord, this is our prayer. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.